Well, this is the last message in this series of messages on a, a lighthouse for stormy times. And certainly this is a, this is a stormy time for many people during this uh, pandemic. And hopefully uh, you have been encouraged by the Word of God, and especially in what Paul has had to say in Romans chapter 8. Uh, next week we'll begin right into a new series on the Holy Spirit. I've had over the last couple of years, I've had several people ask me about the Holy Spirit. And so um, we're going to do a short series on that. It'll probably take us right up to December. And, uh, but we're going to be talking about, again, the Holy Spirit, how to, how to experience the Holy Spirit. We're, we're not going to be going, it's not going to be a topical study in the sense that we go from you know, a number of different verses to demonstrate or to show what the Holy Spirit, who He is. But we're really going to, we're going to kind of jump into different passages in which the Holy Spirit is central to that passage, paramount to that passage. And we're going to really deal with that passage and what it has to say or, and the inferences it might have for the Holy Spirit. Well, I don't know about you, but um, when I was a young boy, on occasion, I would have a teacher or a coach, uh, a brother. I, I don't know that I ever heard my dad say this, but I'd have someone say to me, hey, you're skating on thin ice. You ever had that? Anybody ever said that to you? And, uh, of course, I knew at that moment that uh, I was in uh, uh, some serious, I was in a precarious position. Uh, as a young per person, uh, I knew that my uh, posterior was at risk at that point. And uh, as I got older, I knew that certain privileges that I had were at risk as well. Well, as adults, we all experience the feeling of living life on thin ice. There are times when perhaps you've felt like, man, I'm hanging by a thread, I'm on thin ice. Now, adults would prefer to say it this way. They would per say something like, the bottom is falling out of my financial situation. My marriage is collapsing. My health is falling apart. My work situation is disintegrating. We all know what it means to, to live with uncertainty. I mean, we've all faced the unexpected turn of events in which our dreams and our hopes and our desires were dashed by something, so by that turn of events. Well, every single person probably has had that experience. The good thing, though, and what Paul is trying to drive home in our passage today is that while things may change around us, in fact, in fact life may seem very capricious, nonetheless, God has some constant principles by which we can kind of sink our anchor into. Uh, the Bible makes it clear that because of the nature of God's love for us, which is unlike anything else we've ever experienced or ever seen, that that love is certain. God's loyalty is certain. His care is certain. His concern for us is unchanging. That truth was and is vividly portrayed in the Old Testament because the Old Testament saints many times in the Psalms would say, God is my strength, he is my refuge, he is my fortress. Uh, they said it over and over again. They said that he is a shelter for me. He's the one who lifts my head. He's one, a shelter to which I can run. In fact, to kind of modernize that, we might say, we might take the illustration of the uh, USS Nimitz, the class aircraft carrier that is uh, quite a ship, I understand. And that ship is fortified by a lot of steel and aluminum. In fact, uh, it's, it's, it's fortified by 500 tons of aluminum, 47,000 tons of steel. And so if you can kind of imagine walking on the deck of that ship, and you're going through waters and sharp, shark-infested waters, turbulence, storm perhaps, and yet 
that ship continues to move as if nothing is happening to it. Well, the air, aircraft carrier of God's love, which is foundational to our relationship with our Lord, will not give way to anything that happens to us. That's what Paul is driving home throughout this passage. This passage that we've been studying makes it very clear that regardless of the tough, stormy times of our lives, we can possess incomprehensible peace and incomparable stability and security in Christ. It's, his love is unchanging. And sadly today, we live in a world in which we never see that. We never see that unconditional, unchanging love. But think of it this way, or perhaps you've had this happen to you. Uh, you're in elementary school, maybe in junior high school, but maybe in elementary school, someone comes to you and they say, Jennifer, I'm using a fictitious name, but they say, Jennifer, uh, one of your classmates, uh, well, Jennifer has told so-and-so, and she told so-and-so, and she told so-and-so, and so-and-so told me that Jennifer likes you. The next day, that same person comes back to you and he says, she says, well, Jennifer told so-and-so and she told so-and-so and she told so-and-so and so-and-so told me, Jennifer doesn't like you today. <laughs> well, over the years, I have come to realize that this situation is not that different from many relationships even as we move beyond uh, elementary school. Proverbs 20, verse 6 says, Many a man proclaims his own loyalty, but who can find a trustworthy man? What's that passage saying? It's saying there are a lot of people who talk about their loyalty or their love and their commitment, but can we really find somebody who really lives that out? That's really a paraphrase of that passage. You will encounter in life a lot of people, sadly, even in the body of Christ, who will profess their commitment to you only to see them walk away, never to return again. And because of those experiences, I believe that there's so many, even God's people, who view God's love as just as capricious. In fact, they view God's love as on a thermostat. That's the title of the message today, is God's love on a thermostat? And of course, you know the answer. Listen, when God chooses to set his love on his children, his unchanging nature, now get this, his unchanging nature ensures that nothing fickle, nothing capricious can ever happen or to change the temperature of that love. So as we come to the end of this series in Romans, we, we see the Apostle Paul's final words of, of comfort and encouragement. And it really, he answers the question, again, it's kind of a finale here. He answers the question, you know, what am I to think about God's love during adversity? So grab your Bibles and, or your electronic device and turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Again, this last paragraph in Romans, beginning uh, verse, uh, chapter 8, beginning in verse 35, really uh, is the great climax of the great doctrinal uh, section of the, Bible, of, of the book of Romans. Keep in mind that the book of Romans is divided into three sections. The first section from chapter 1 through chapter 8 has to do with the doctrinal section. Chapters 9 through 11 have to do with Israel. And then the remaining part of the book has to do with the practical aspect of the Christian life. But it, this chapter ends that first section. And essentially, again, what Paul is saying, listen, all of this, all of this doctrinal stuff that I've given you over and over again, it has practical implications for your salvation as well as for God's love. So let's pick it up and begin reading in verse 35. And I'm just going to read the first part of verse 35. It says, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Now, we'll stop right there. That phrase, love of Christ, when you see that in this context, in this chapter, it's synonymous with our salvation. 
I'll show you that later on in a, in a few moments. But basically, it's, it's saying that, okay, the love of Christ, our salvation, that love that was demonstrated to us on the cross, our, and, and, and that which we have now taken to ourselves as our salvation, he is saying or asking that rhetorical question, who can separate, what can separate us from that salvation? You following me here? You're tracking? Because it's, it, even though it speaks of his love, it's, it's even broader than that. And it's interesting, the word, uh, the most common word for separate is a fidezo, which is not used here. The word that's used here is karidzo, and it's translated in the New Testament as country, as region, as land, as field. And it means, can anyone put a distance, can anyone put a country between Christ's love and us? Can anyone put uh, uh, such a distance between Christ, or God, and our salvation? And you know the answer demands a negative response. And then he goes on to talk about, he says, who can separate us? Will it be tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Now, I want to just kind of go over these briefly so you understand what he's talking about here. The word tribulation speaks of pressure. It's the ellipsis in the Greek, and it speaks of pressure that one feels. And the word was often connected are associated with when they wanted to punish a person and even kill a person. They would put a person on the ground or on some type of platform, and they would have this hydraulic, back then an ancient hydraulic, but nonetheless, this hydraulic would pick up this giant bolter, huge bolter, and they would lure that, bo that bolter down on the chest of the person. And sometimes they would just make him scream and, and just, you know, torture him. Sometimes they would even take his life. That's, word, that's the word that's associated with, that, with pressure. But the next word that's used here as well, distress, speaks of a tight squeeze. And it is very closely related to the ellipsis. So do you ever feel in, the, in life that the pressure is so great you feel like it can't get any worse? I couldn't help but think of... Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8, when Paul said, We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always, and watch this, always caring about in the body the dying of Jesus, so that, purpose clause, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. What was Paul saying? Paul was saying, listen, the walls may be, I, 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 my mind, I thought of Twilight Zone, and you see this show where sometimes the walls start moving in, and you feel like you're going to be crushed. And Paul said, the walls are coming in. But he says, I know my God is constant, that my God will stand and hold those walls out for me. Then he mentions persecution. Now, the word persecution is not talking about just harassment. This word has more the idea of one who is being pursued, chased. And then you have the word famine. You know what a famine is. Then it has, you have the word nakedness. Now, that's not, that word is not alluding to nudity. That, what that word is speaking about is about people, believers, who for whatever reason, either they don't have the money or perhaps people won't sell them uh, clothes, but it's an idea of their being so poor that they don't have the money or are not able to purchase clothes to keep them warm during the winter. And then there's the word peril. And the word peril means in danger or at risk. It's interesting, this word is only used one other place in the New Testament, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26. In that verse, it's used eight times. Listen to this. I have been on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. That's a, that word danger is a word that's used here, peril. 
So Paul gives this rhetorical question that demands a negative answer. He says, can hardship, can dangerous situations, can persecution separate us? In other words, take away our salvation and God's lo- hence God's love for us. And the answer is absolutely not. <laughs> I, I, I'm, well, I'm not going to go there yet. We'll get there in a minute. But I, I was reminded of this as I studied. I reminded of the passage in, in, in the Old Testament in which God speaks to his believing uh, Jewish people, the remnant, and he says in Jeremiah 31, the Lord appeared to him from afar saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have drawn you with loving kindness. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Everlasting. What's everlasting? Is there an end to it? No. Now, as he goes on here, Paul reassures them of God's love by calling their attention to an Old Testament passage in Psalm 44, verse 22. It's a passage that David wrote. Let's read verse 36. He says, Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. <laughs> he's talking to believers. Now follow this. He's talking to believers. He said, this is our lot, folks. This is what happens to us. He uses an Old Testament analogy. analogy. But Paul is reciting, I mean, excuse me, David, Paul is reciting David who recites from the Septuagint. What's the Septuagint? Septuagint was the Old Testament translation uh, into Greek. And he quotes there and he says, listen, you shouldn't be surprised. God's people shouldn't be surprised that you will suffer. You will suffer. So, Here's the first, here's how I want you to write down the first one. Adversity can be a sign of one's salvation, not God's rejection. Adversity can be a sign of God's salvation, of God's love on, uh, of you, not a rejection. Christians, many Christians, at least as I see it, and I have my theory about as to why many Christians think this way, But many Christians think when things are not going well and they're not getting, quote, blessed, and they're they're not, you know, in a rose garden, they're not experiencing a Disneyland of some spiritual type, they think, God must not love me. What did I I do wrong? To me, Paul is uh, clearly, no doubt, is somewhat repetitive in this whole section, especially what he's saying here in verses 35 through 39, in my view, is what he's already said in a different way coming up to this point in this passage. But when you understand how believers so often doubt God's love for them, you understand why Paul is repeating himself again. Uh, Paul did this throughout the Bible. One of the, in one case, he was talking to Timothy, who, was, who struggled with fear. And he said to Timothy, Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. By the way, I want you to note that phrase, in Christ Jesus. We're going to come back to that. You see, before the Apostle Paul wrote this epistle that I'm talking about, to Timothy here, God's faithful children had suffered not just at the hands of the Gentiles, but had suffered at the hands of the Jews, their own people. I want you to hold your place, and I want you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter, excuse me, not 1 Corinthians, 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4, and we're going to pick it up in verse 12. 1 Peter chapter 4, it says, Beloved, do not be surprised at fiery ordeal, at the fiery ordeal among you. What did he say? Did he say be surprised? No, not, don't be surprised. Which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. 
Today, and, and, and I, would, I would argue today that believers in our, the 21st century here in America, they treat this suffering just like this passage tells them not to treat it. As if, why is this happening to me? Why, God, are you treating me this way? <laughs> Let's read on. Verse 13 says, but to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, watch this, keep on rejoicing so that, purpose clause, so that also the revelation, what is that talking about? When you see the revelation of Christ, the revelation of his glory, he's taught there, he's, the passage is talking about when Christ returns at the end of the tribulation. That's exactly what he's talking about. That's what Paul's been talking about, in fact, in, in Romans 8, he talks about at the end of the tribulation, Christ comes back, but we also come back with him, and we experience our glorification. So that also the revelation of his glory, uh, you may rejoice with exaltation. Now watch verse 14. He says, if you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Verse 15, he says, don't, don't be accused of something you've done that's wrong. And it's, you, you deserve being accused of that. that he, he, Paul, Peter is saying, don't, don't mix this up here. Don't get this mixed up with being persecuted. And then verse 16, he says, but if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this name. Something I want you to think about. Why is it today that many believers in our country have this caricature of the Christian life? You say, what do you mean caricature? I believe the caricature is that everything should be wonderful. There are those who preach the prosperity doctrine that says, if you just have enough faith, perhaps give enough that God will bless you and your life is going to be just wonderful from this day forward. And yet, what did Peter say? Peter was saying, when you sign on the dotted line, folks, you're in the fire. You're in the battle. I've uh, shared with you before that um, when I was pastoring in Riverside, California, uh, the Riverside Fire Department came to me and asked me if I would be their chaplain. And so I said, sure, I'll be glad to do that. And uh, so I had a great relationship for 10 years, and, and, uh, um, and, and oftentimes they would call me, uh, they gave me a, a radio, and they said, here, you can hear everything we do. And, and sometimes they would call me, they, they'd say, we got this big fire, you might want to come out and just watch us. And, and so I remember one time they called, us, called me, and there was this, it was a three-alarm fire, I think it was. I, my understanding, if, if I re remember, is a three-alarm fire meant there was three different stations that were had called into this to deal with this fire, and it was a hot summer day. In Riverside, it can get to 110 degrees. Now, it's not humid like this, like it is here, but listen, in Southern California at 110 degrees, it's hot. And I, I was standing by the chief, and I watched these, these firemen come up to the chief and say things to him and say, talk about what's going on and so forth. But I noticed something about firemen. They love fighting fires. Sometimes I wondered if they didn't set the fire so they go, well, I'm kidding, of course. They love fighting fires. That's what they, they knew that was what they were called to do. They would go into that fire. Now imagine you've got a rookie fireman. He's gone through the training. There's some training going on there. and They do get close to the fire, but they don't go into a, a giant building I mean, there's a lot of risk involved. My br oldest brother, uh, his best friend in high school became a fireman, and he was killed in a fire. It's high, it's high risk. But imagine a rookie. He, he's, he's gone through all the training. He's got, you know, he's got his insurance. He's got everything, and uh, he's ready, you know. But then he, they have this giant fire that I witness. And he says, uh, they say, come on, let's go. We're going into the fire. The fire. He, he said, well, uh, I'm, not, I'm not going there. Why? That's what you're trained for. That's what you're here for. Uh -uh. Yeah, I mean, I, I signed up for the insurance and the benefits, and, 
you know, and, and this will pay for my education. And, uh, but I'm not going in that fire, man. Somebody could get hurt in there. A lot of Christians are just that way, are they not? I don't want to get hurt. I don't want to suffer. I don't want a difficult time. Folks, it's a fire. It's a spiritual battle. Remember the, the, the many passages speak, passage, as we just read, many passages speak of the fiery ordeal. That's a Christian life. See, God boldly promises his faithful love to us, even though the problems and challenges of life pose what might seem to us uh, threats to that love of God. The Apostle Paul opposed the question in order to answer it. God's love can endure anything. God's love can endure disappointment, tomorrow's failures, and crisis. Now back in Romans 8, as we continue there, in verse 37, uh, interesting here, he says, but in all these things we Let's we'll stop right there. Now, notice the, the but is the conjunction of contrast, we call it in, in English. He's giving us a contrast. It's almost as if Paul is saying, listen, can anything separate us from the love of God? No. Tribulation, distress, you know, on and on and on. Nothing can. And it's almost like, Mm, I understand what you're feeling here, and you're still struggling perhaps with, even though I tell you that nothing can separate us from God's love, it's, I know you're feeling, well, I don't feel that way. But he says, but, but, pay attention to this. Here's the great news. <laughs> don't lose heart, basically, because we are, what he says in here, we are overwhelmingly conqueror. We overwhelmingly conquer, I should say, through him who loved us. In the Greek, it's just one word. Now, it's interesting here. The word conqueror, or just by itself, if you just said conqueror, it would just be the word nikeo, which means victory. In fact, here's a trivia note for you. The noun form of that verb nikeo is Nike. It means victory. It means to conquer. It, but here, the Apostle Paul, he could have just said, we're, we're conquerors. You don't have to fear. But here he says, we are overwhelming conquerors. He adds the word hooper. The word hooper, uh, here it is, which means on top of or above. So he's saying we are conquerors on top of conquerors. Interesting, the Latin, the Latin is very re closely related, the Latin language, I should say, is closely related to the Greek, and the word that's very similar is hyper, which means super. So he's essentially, we could t tie all this together and he, see that he is saying we are super, uh, super conquerors in Christ. So here's number two. God has made you a super conqueror not a loser. A super conqueror, not a loser. The word has a, the idea that we are more than just barely winning. We watch some games, football games, now is the season, and we'll see teams that will win by one point. And, and then somebody will say, man, we really let you, we really gave it to you guys. What? One point? No. But if they beat you, 50 to nothing, they more than conquered, right? Yeah. Now, the second thing I want you to note here, he says, uh, you're more than conquerors through him who loved us. Now, that word loved is a key word here because it's in the aorist tense, which gives the idea of a once for all, at a one, I should say, a, a, at a point in time in which he loved us. So what does he mean by that? There's so many cases in the New Testament in which in the original text, the, the, the present tense is used to speak of God's continuous love. 
But here it says he loved us. So what, what, what's it mean here when it says we, are, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us? It is pointing right back to the cross. His, the crescendo of his love what, reached its peak at the cross. And what he's saying here is his victory on the cross and his victory over the grave guarantees that we are super victors. Too often Christians are lamenting about how difficult trials are. And I don't want to downplay trials. I don't want to say that they're, they're not difficult. They are. But so often we hear people say, well, it's just, uh, I just, uh, I just, man, I, it's just too difficult. And it's, it's okay at times to not be okay, but you can't stay there. But so often we say, well, you know, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, you know, that God's not going to allow you to have anything that you cannot withstand. You cannot, that's going to do you in. And it says he will provide a way to escape. And that's, that's a promise. And I, I don't want to diminish the value of that promise. But our trials should not be walking over us. We should be walking over our trials. Think of the effect of gravity. If I take this Bible, I won't do that, but if I were to drop this, well, it's going to go to the floor, right? It's not going to stay in midair, right? That's because of gravity. But if I were to bring a table out here, or like this pulpit, I put the, the Bible there, it nullifies, marginalizes gravity, does it not? Our circumstances, our trials, Satan and his desire for us and even our flesh, they all pull us down like gravity. That's what, what Satan wants to do. That's what the old nature does. And that's what our, the, world, the circumstances of, of our world around us, they all pull us down. It's the word of God, what, like what Paul's talking about here, with the Holy Spirit that neutralizes and withholds that that pull of gravity in our lives, that spiritual pull of gravity. Too often we see ourselves as losers because we give in to that pull of gravity instead of saying, hey, hey, no, I'm a winner. I'm a victor. I do not have to give in to this. And I would encourage you that if you go to the Lord and you claim the promises and you begin to pray and say, Lord, I know this is not where you want me. If I'm struggling right now, I know this is not where you want me. And I'm asking you, I'm yielding, I'm surrendering my life to your Holy Spirit to lift me up and to hold me through this. It will make a difference. Now in verse 35, the Apostle Paul mentions all the threats to us in the physical world. Let's go back and look at verse 35. It says, well, tribulation, distress, persecution, et cetera, et cetera. Now, when we get to verse, verses 38 and 39, I believe what he's doing here is he's mentioning the threats in the spiritual world. The first one was kind of in the physical world, the things around us, the things that happen to us. But now he says, what about those things in the spiritual world? And basically, he's saying there are no loopholes here. Look what he says. For He says, for I am convinced. Now, let's just stop right there. That word convinced is a, a, a perfect tense, which has the idea of I've, I've become convinced at a point in time, and I stand convinced. Paul is saying, I've gone through enough. I've read God. I've had God's revelation to me, and I've trusted his Holy Spirit to guide me. And so I've come to this place where I am standing firm, and I will not budge by God's help. Now, how did he become convinced? Was it by a surge of emotions? No. It's a passive voice. In fact, it means that something's acting upon him. First Peter, uh, excuse me, Second Peter chapter 1 says, Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Now how? Through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. Through the knowledge. And it's interesting here, it's not, it's not the word that speaks of full knowledge, but it speaks of experiential knowledge. So Peter says, God has given us everything that we need for living this Christian life through his word. 
And essentially, he's in He's inferring that the more I live by the word and the more I experience the truth of his word in my life, I know, I know, as Paul said, I am convinced that nothing will separate me. It's interesting in the, um, the hymn, hymn, that great hymn, It Is Well with, his, with My Soul, Horatio Spafford the story behind that song is that when he wrote that song, there's a line in that song that says, teach me to say it is well with my soul. The story behind that is that that was changed. The Horatio wrote, teach me to know it is well with my soul. When we know it, then we can respond and affirm it is well with my soul. Knowledge is the instrument panel on that, on that spiritual airplane that enables me to get through the fog when I can't see what's in front of me. God's word does that for us. Here's number three. God wants you to live with confidence, not fear or anxiety. God wants you to live with confidence, not fear or anxiety. He says neither um, I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing, now watch this, will separate us from the love of God, now watch this phrase, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That phrase, that phrase, phrase is a critical phrase in scripture. Do not see that phrase as simply a, a, a simple prepositional phrase. It's more than that. It is packed with theological implications for the Christian. I need somebody to help me with this illustration. So, Jim, you're the closest. Would you come help me with this? So, I'm going to give you two things here. Um, and, and I washed my hands before I came, so I don't have COVID. So, so Jim, I gave you a, a red, a red. Open that red thing up. The little slip there it says, uh, "What's it say?" Christ. Christ. Now, what's the other envelope say? The Christian. The Christian. Okay. Now, so it says we are. The Bible tells us that we are in Christ. So put the the in Christ into the envelope. So Christ is in the Christian, right? So hold it up so they can see that, the Christian. Christ is in there. Now, but the Bible also tells us that we are in Christ, right? So let's put the Christian that has Christ in him in Christ. Now, is there another step here? Well, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 3 says, You are dead and, and you are hidden in Christ, uh, with Christ in God. So, my last envelope is God. So, we put the Christian who has Christ in him, and now is in Christ, and now he is hidden in God. So, where's the envelope for the Christian? Very deep, very deep, exactly. That's exactly the answer. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's, that shows where we are in Christ. So, Why is that important? Why is all this important? Because there's so many Christians today who would say, what if I, I, I send myself out, outside of God's love and acceptance? Or what if Satan snatches me from God? Is that possible? Well, that illustration shows that we are hidden in God, in Christ. We're in Christ, in God. Now, let me show you the biblical delineation of that. Turn to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. And for those who have seen me talk about John chapter 10, or heard me talk about John 10, verse 28, uh, please bear with me. Uh, you have uh, heard me talk about this numerous times, but I uh, there are some who perhaps have not heard me talk about, uh, explain this. 
In John 28, Jesus is speaking, and he says, I give eternal life to them. Who would be them? Which? Believers, right? It's you. And they will never, who, who are they? It's you, believers. They will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Now, one of the great things about the original Greek language is that it kind of brings out the high definition of a passage. And here, I don't think there's any other place in the Bible where it does it so wonderfully as it does here. Let's, look, let's examine this. He says, I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. Now, the word never perish, the word never represents a double negative in the Greek. It means they shall no, 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 never perish. Now, again, that's bad English, but that's great Greek. So they said they will no, never perish. And then the word perish is in the Greek subjunctive mood. Now follow me here. The Greek subjunctive mood means that they don't even, with the negative, it means that they don't even, don't even ha have the potential of perishing. You see, if you took off the negative, it would say they have the potential of perishing. But when you take, put a negative in front of it, it says they don't even have the potential of perishing. Now here's another thing. It's in the middle voice. We got that one? Middle voice. The, the subject acts upon itself, thus meaning they do not even have the potential to perish in and of themselves. You see that? Now, let's say, well, what, 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 what about Satan? What about Satan? Well, look at this. It says, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Can it be any more clear? Can it be any more definite? We are in Christ. We are hidden in Christ. And let me, and, 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 and let me just give one last response to those who say, well, what if I send myself out of reach of God? Here's my simple answer, question. My question would be, did you live a perfect life and did you die on the cross for your own sin? And the answer is what? No. You had nothing to do with it. All you can do is accept it. If you had nothing to do with it, your salvation, you can have nothing to do with taking it away. You follow me? So let's review. Jared, we have them. First, Adversity can be a sign of one's salvation, not, God, not God's rejection. Number two, God has made you a super conqueror, not a loser. This week, live. Change the image in your mind of how you view yourself as a believer. If you view yourself as a loser, change it. And thirdly, God wants you to live with confidence, not fear or anxiety. The application here. I'm not going to go to all of them, but just, hear, just, just go with this. Rest in God's confidence that he gives you. There's a story that's told about the Golden Gate Bridge. The bridge was built in 1933, and the task of building that bridge was a daunting task. And the story goes this way, that uh, the estimate for building that bridge would be about $100, $100 million dollars. And they also estimated that for every million dollars, you can count on one person, one construction worker, losing their life, falling to their death. But Joseph Strauss, who built this bridge, realized when they built the, after watching the Oakland uh, Bay Bridge being built, in which they lost 26 lives, work construction workers. He came up with this idea. He said, we're going to put safety first and we're going to build this, uh, we're going to put up this net. Now, at that time, in 1933, that net would cost $135,000. They thought that was somewhat extravagant. But nonetheless, they spent the money and put the net up. As they found, once the workers realized that they had a safety net under them, they worked well. In fact, they finished the job ahead of time and under budget. What's the idea? What's my point? When we rest in who we are in Christ and God's love for us 
we can live the Christian life with joy instead of fear. And that was Paul's point. When things are going bad, you don't say, maybe God doesn't love me. Let's do away with, let's do away with doubting or second-guessing God, okay? Let's do away with that, and let's trust him. 